reading from the second letter of St. Paul to, to the Corinthians. Brothers and sisters, if only you would put up with a little foolishness from me. Please put up with me, for I am jealous of you with the jealousy of God, since I betrothed you to the one husband to present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. But I am afraid that, as the serpent delivered Eve by his cunning, your thoughts may be corrupted from a sincere and pure commitment to Christ. For if someone comes and preaches another Jesus than the one we preached, or if you receive a different spirit from the one you received, or a different gospel from the one you accepted, you put up with it well enough. For I think that I am not in any way inferior to these super apostles. Even if I am un untrained in speaking, I am not so in knowledge. In every way, we have made this plain to you in all things. Did I make a mistake when I humbled myself so that you might be exalted? Because I preached the gospel of God to you without charge, I plundered other churches by accepting from them in order to minister to you. When I was with you and in need, I did not burden anyone. For the brothers who came from Macedonia supplied my needs. So I refrained and will refrain from burdening you in any way. By the truth of Christ in me, this boast of mine shall not be silenced in the regions of Achaia. And why? Because I do not love you. God knows I do. Verbum Domini. Your works, O Lord, are justice and truth. Your works, O Lord, are justice and truth. I will give thanks to the Lord with all my heart. In the company and assembly of the just, great are the works of the Lord, exquisite in all their delights. Your works, O Lord, are justice and truth. Majesty and glory are his work, and his justice endures forever. He is one renowned for his wondrous deeds. Gracious and merciful is the Lord. Your words, Lord, are justice and truth. The works of his hands are faithful and just. Sure are all his precepts, reliable forever and ever, wrought in truth and equity. Your words, Lord, are justice and Dominus Fabesco, Lexio Sancti Evangelii Secundum Matteum. Jesus said to his disciples, 
In praying, do not babble like the pagans, who think they will be heard because of their many words. Do not be like them. Your Father knows what you need before you ask him. This is how you are to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. If you forgive others their transgressions, your heavenly Father will forgive you. But if you do not forgive others, neither will your Father forgive your transgressions. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord. Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, today we celebrate the feast of two of the principal martyrs to the Protestant Reformation and to the injustice of a monarch, Henry VIII, with the feast of St. John Fisher, who was a bishop and very elderly when he was martyred, and Thomas More, who of course was a lawyer and one of the more famous lights of the age of um, the Renaissance and its humanism. And the passages today from our scriptures help us to understand their witness more because we're continuing on with the Sermon on the Mount. And the issue here has to do with prayer. What prayer in the new community with the new law should be like. Christ tells his apostles, don't babble on like the pagans. Now, does he condemn rep repetitive prayer like the rosary? Not at all. What he's talking about is the fact that the pagans were very superstitious, and they believed when they requested favors from their gods that unless you m named every single god, if you left one out, you didn't get it. <laughs> and so they were greatly at pains to be sure they named every single God that was involved in giving them things. Instead, our Lord talks about the true faith, the faith which we talked about in the opening prayer today, which we profess with our lips, but we need to put into our interior selves, which is very simple. The question people often ask is, well, if God knows what I need, why do I need to say it? because you need to say it. In other words, it's important for you to realize that you depend upon God for all the positive things you have, existence, of course, being the primary one, and you also depend upon God to shield you from doing evil or from the evil that others wish to do to you. And so the Lord presents us with this very simple prayer, and instead of the names of thousands of gods, Father, which is an intimate term, so we're invited again to divine intimacy. We have basically three petitions that express the majesty of God himself in his own nature. And then we have the other petitions that have to do with our, well, our dependence on God for good things, our daily bread. And some of the authors would say, like Teresa of Avila interprets the daily bread as the Holy Eucharist. And then you have trying to defend yourself from temptation and ask God's aid and support in that. And then interestingly enough, this passage ends with the admonition for forgiveness because Teresa of Avila was of the opinion in her work, The Way of Perfection, that if you couldn't forgive others their offenses against you, why do you expect to be forgiven? And not only that, but that's a sign to her of contemplative prayer, of communion with God, because our Lord himself forgave us from the cross. Now, in the case of Thomas More and John Fisher, they prayed these prayers, of course, and many of the Christian faithful in uh, the times when Christianity was the primary, Catholicism, the only religion, really, the primary religion in Western Europe. 
and they were martyred during Henry VIII. Perhaps that's the reason why we have the beautiful polyphony today sung to us, because it's the sort of music that was sung at the time in the mass when they were killed. They uh, took this seriously in the sense that they wanted to express their faith in the one God and in the one Christ. Paul talks about this today, about the Corinthians saying, you know, if another person comes to another apostle and preaches to you another Christ, you just go right along. You don't bother to question, which is what happened in England, where, well, the hierarchy, with the exception of John Fisher, the whole hierarchy, all the bishops, all voted to support the title of the king as head of the church on earth, and therefore deny the papacy, including the Archbishop of Canterbury, who had taken an oath to defend the church and the papacy when he was made archbishop, and the king's own coronation oath had to do with this. They acted against all those just to justify the divorce practices of Henry VIII. So in these days today of ecumenism, what we wish to do is find out what we still hold together in the various Christian sects and denominations. And the difference between now and then isn't that we think everybody believes the same thing. It's that everybody isn't hurling abuse at each other, so you can't have any dialogue whatsoever about the positive things we do agree on. There are, of course, a number of Christian churches that agree with us on abortion. Well, yes, good. Let's amplify that. So, as you know, they were both very highly educated people, considered to be among the intelligentsia of their generation. The king himself called them friends and consulted them constantly when he was in his Catholic phase. And not only that, but they were, uh, in being considered the lights of the age, they helped found universities, they helped to establish schools, and they helped become, by advising the king, agents for good and truth. And yet, when the question of the divorce practices came up, he killed them. And he killed them unjustly. John Fisher was known as a saint practically even while he was alive. And he was a wonderful scholar of the new scholarship at the time, especially concerning the scriptures. And yet, he was killed. He was killed for the sake of the one Christ. Christ is one as his church is one. And neither one of them could see how they could get around that mystery or that truth. So today, on the Feast of Thomas More and John Fisher, it's worth recalling some of the lines from the film, The Man for All Seasons. In one of them, as Thomas More is in prison before he's going to be executed, his daughter comes to try to convince him to take the oath. And reflecting our prayer today, she says, you've always told me that God more regards the thoughts of the heart than the words of the lips, yes. Well, good, take the oath with your lips and don't mean it in your heart. And Thomas More in the author's play answers, what else then is an oath but words we say to God? And he says, when a man takes an oath, he holds himself in his very hands like water. And if he opens his fingers then and lets it loose, he may never hope to find himself again once he's lost himself. He says, some men aren't capable of this, but I'd be loath to think your father one of them. And she says, but in reason, haven't you done all that God could reasonably expect of you? After all, you're a highly educated man. You've always tried to lead your country by what you believe to be true as Lord Chancellor. The same is true of John Fisher as Bishop. Haven't you in reason done all that God can reasonably expect of you? And Thomas More answers, with the thing that should touch our hearts as we say the Lord's Prayer over and over again. Well, finally, it's not a matter of reason. Finally, it's a matter of love. <laughs>